All right, welcome everyone. You can head back in, find your seats. If you don't know who I am, I'm Matt Slocum. I'm from here, I grew up here. Um, <clears throat> it's good to be back. I haven't got to speak for a while here, so I'm excited. Um, I have a heart for this place and all you people, so I hope <clears throat> that I have something for you tonight. I want to just bless you guys, bless everyone here with the Word of God. Um, I have to say, it's funny, Josh asked me to preach, and uh, I got to read his text because I like to make fun of him when I uh, get the chance. I, hold on, I got, some, I got texts I haven't read. Also, if you guys want to know something about me, I'm a horrible texter, emailer. I have 5,100 unread work emails that are very important that everybody tells me, hey, you really need to read this. Why can I not find his text? Oh, here we go. Okay, so I, he said, uh, I said, hey, is there anything in particular I should be preaching on? This was being very serious. I was doing my diligence. Um, he said, no, man, feel free to go nuts. <laughs> okay, here I am. Cool. <clears throat> um, I want to start out tonight... This isn't what I'm talking about, but if you have a Bible with you, I didn't give this to Miss Sherry. I just got done telling her, I was like, hey, I've learned to mark my verses because it's way better than trying to look them up on the fly. Here I am. I got one I need to look up on the fly. Um, turn to Zechariah 9, <clears throat> verse 12. I just had this verse pop into my head as we were singing. This isn't what I'm preaching on. But it's, uh, it's a good verse. The Lord gave me this verse a while back. It's my verse, but I'm going to share it with you tonight for free. <clears throat> Zechariah 9, verse 12 says this, Return to your stronghold, prisoners of hope. Today I declare to you that I will restore to you double. Um, I just really have this thing that, uh, this thought, that disappointment is one of the most devastating things in the life of a believer. Disappointment is always tied to your past. It's tied to the dreams that didn't come true. It's tied to um, hurt. And it's always things that happen in your past. Um, I just want you to know, you are born for the future. God has a plan for you. Um, Paul writes, he says, nothing can se separate me from the love of God. Neither, neither things present or future. Notice he doesn't say past. Not because the past can disconnect you from the love of God, but it, makes you, it can make you unaware of God's love for you. If you dwell on the disappointments, the broken dreams of your past, it will numb you to knowing God's love. Does that make sense? If you're disconnected from the love of God by disappointment, ultimately what it does is it distorts and twists your view of the goodness of God. 70% of the theology I hear around and the thoughts about God I hear around the church are based off of a twisted view of the goodness of God that's really centered around a disappointment in someone's life that isn't based on what his word says. <clears throat> so I just wanted to encourage, encourage you, return to the stronghold prisoners of hope. New American Standard says prisoners who have hope, but I just want to point out in the original language, it's prisoners of hope, that you're so bound to hope you're a prisoner of it. How many of you know hope is a good ball and chain to carry around on your leg? You say, nothing is taking my hope away, right? No disappointment, no broken dream, no broken relationship is taking my hope away. I'm bound to it, okay? It's not what I'm talking about. Just wanted to encourage you with that tonight. Sometimes I have a hard time 
telling if I'm feeling the Spirit of God in a place or if I just didn't eat enough that day. So I'm not sure where we're at. <clears throat> I'm working through that. It's kind of what we're going to talk about a little bit tonight. If you have your Bible, again, uh, turn to 1 Kings chapter 3. I heard, um, I think it was James Gall said, he's a, he's a pretty well-known Christian author in the Christian world. I heard, think it was him that said, uh, complaining about God being silent while your Bible is closed is like complaining about not getting a text message when your phone's turned off. And that just made sense to me. The main point of this is not so that you can argue things, not so that you can memorize it, but so that you have the living God speak to you. I'm working on, uh, for my church, I'm working on a uh, class slash conference on how to read your Bible my first entrance point in that conference on how to read your Bible is this. In the natural world, you get hungry from not eating, right? You don't eat, you get hungry. God's kingdom is always backwards from the natural world. In his kingdom, you eat to get hungry. In the natural, you get hungry when you don't eat. In his kingdom, you get hungry from eating. Sitting this on your shelf, not eating it, isn't going to make you hungry. But as you start to read it, you actually gain more and more hunger for the things of God. So the first step, if you struggle with reading your Bible, is to start reading your Bible. You have to eat to get hungry in God's kingdom. All right? Um, I want to talk about... um, Wisdom tonight. Um, <clears throat> I, I was going through my notes last night and because I was looking for a date. I was looking for a date that I started something. I studied grace, almost only grace, for five years. I dove into grace for five years of my life, like really hard study on this thing called grace. Um, From that, from five years of my life, my favorite verse on grace is in Ephesians 2. It's Paul talking about uh, Jesus was raised from the dead so that in the ages to come, we might know the immeasurable extent of his grace. Let me put that to you in English for you. In the ages to come, in eternity to come, we will barely start to scratch the surface of this thing called grace. Isn't that a great place to be after five years of studying only grace? Oh, cool. I haven't even started to scratch the surface, and in a million years from now, I'll still not even be scratching the surface of it. What I realized is that when people come with definitions of grace, it's God's unmerited favor. It's his empowerment to keep the law. It's this, it's that. And they have these new insights. I say, yeah, that's good, but that's not the fullness of it. Because in a billion years from now, we still won't even be close to the fullness of grace. From that, I started to write down these words that kind of line up with grace. I call them kingdom words. Okay, A kingdom word is this. It is a word that Webster's Dictionary does not help you with. It does not help you define these words. Grace is one of them. You can go to Webster's Dictionary. You can get a definition of grace. It's probably not really what it means in the kingdom. It may give you a little insight into what it means, but it's not the fullness of it. Are you following me so far? Faith is a kingdom word. Paul says the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. They're kingdom words, right? You're not going to simply define them from a dictionary, from our English language. They will be defined specifically by the word of God. Does that make sense? And so I've got a constantly expanding list of these things called kingdom words. 
can't dive into all of them tonight, but tonight we're going to look at one of them that I am focusing on that's super important, and it is wisdom. Wisdom is a kingdom word. Okay, it is not specifically defined by knowing things. I heard a pastor one time say, knowledge is knowing things, wisdom is knowing how to apply things. That sounds good. There's a piece of that that's true, but it's not the full depth of what wisdom is. Wisdom's very important. There are five books in the Bible called the books of wisdom. Proverbs, early on in Proverbs chapter two or three-ish, says that God laid the foundations of the world through wisdom. Okay, wisdom is very important. Um, <clears throat> most of you probably know the story of Solomon. King Solomon, who is King David's son, is considered to be, besides Jesus, the wisest man who ever lived. So I want to look at his story as we begin to talk about wisdom, and then I want to uh, help us apply it to community, to your church, to the church as a whole. There is a point for wisdom. God has a purpose for wisdom uh, within his people. He has a purpose for it within our individual lives, but he has a greater purpose for it as a community. Okay? So, uh, Michelle, if you can pull that scripture up, <clears throat> 1 Kings chapter 3. This is the story where God comes to Solomon in the middle of the night in a dream. And he says, whatever you want, ask me for it, and I'll give it to you. You familiar, familiar with that story? <clears throat> Solomon says this as a response to uh, God saying, I'll give you whatever you want. Solomon says, give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil, for who is able to govern this, your great people. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind. Now, I want to uh, just look at that part right there that says understanding mind. In the Hebrew, what Solomon actually says is this. It's a little weird, but this is literally what he says. He says, God, I want you to give me a hearing heart. The picture is I want an ear put on my heart. Isn't that weird? God says, hey, ask anything you want. I'll give it to you. Solomon says, um, I think I want an ear put on my heart. Okay? <clears throat> Verse 10. It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked for this. And God said to him, because you have asked for this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, behold, now I do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind. Some translations say I give you wisdom and a discerning mind. In the Hebrew, God actually says, I give you wisdom. What happened? Solomon says, God, I want an ear on my heart. I want my heart to be able to hear. God says, okay, I'll give you wisdom. What is wisdom? It is a heart that is able to hear God. You got that? Wisdom is not knowledge. It encompasses that, but that's not what it biblically is. It is a heart open and able to hear what God is saying. <clears throat> um, I find it interesting because I just think a lot of times we think of wisdom as you, you have to be lived a lot of life. You have to be very old to walk in wisdom or, or you know, whatever. You have to know a lot. You have to have read 500,000 books to walk in wisdom or whatever it is. Um, it's interesting to me. Solomon became king when he was 20 years old. He died before he was 60. That's pretty young in our world, right? He didn't live to be a wise old 90-year-old sage. He didn't start walking in wisdom when he was 45 years old. He became king and the wisest king the world had ever known at the age of 20. And he walked in that for about 40 years. Um, I want to show you in Matthew 5 how this applies to us. In Matthew 5, 
Jesus gives us a couple examples of what the church is like. We're just going to look at one in Matthew 5, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out, trampled under people's feet. You are the salt of the earth. Who's Jesus talking to? Who's he talking about? Anybody? This is not a trick question. (laughs) Front row. Us, right? His church. His people. You're the salt of the earth. You're sprinkled out throughout this world. You bring preservation. You bring flavor. But there's there's a hidden thing in this verse. It's a little bit hidden in the English anyway. It says, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, that phrase lost its taste is from one word. Okay? It's one word called morino. Can you say morino? I taught this to a youth group a little while ago, and I was like, you always have to come up with something dumb for them to remember the words. I was like, just think like you want more of the big animal, the rhino. That's all it is. More rhino. I need more rhino. What Morino means, uh, literally, is foolish. But if salt becomes foolish, what's the opposite of foolishness? Wisdom. See, God has this purpose for his people, that through divine wisdom, that is, people whose heart hear his voice, they're spread into their community and their society, And people see that they have answers, right, to the questions that their hearts have had for a long time. That they, that God's people speak into people's lives, purpose, and destiny through wisdom. Jesus walked perfectly in wisdom in that he only said what he heard the Father say and only did what he saw him do. That is walking in wisdom. Turn back to 1 Kings. I should have told you to keep your finger there. This is my favorite part. Because I believe this is God's plan for every person in here. This is God's plan for every church community. How many of you have ever seen a relationship or a church community or uh, any other type of grouping of people break up over a lack of wisdom or the enemy got in there and did some things that caused problems. Uh, at my, at a church I was at, my old church, we always used to have this phrase, well, just wait till the devil de- drags his uh, tail through it. All right, there'd be some kind of situation, some kind of issue, it'd go pretty well and just be, well, wait till the devil drags his tail through it. Um, I don't know if you know this or not. The devil should not be dragging his tail through any community of God's people. Just because it happens and it's common doesn't mean it's normal. Cancer is common. It's not normal. Right? Solomon, this king, with great wisdom, leads his people into great prosperity. It says in uh, chapter 4 that the provision Solomon had for one day was 30 cores of fine flour, 60 cores of meal, 10 fat oxen, 20 pasture-fed cattle, 100 sheep. Basically, they had a lot of food. They had a lot of provision. They had a lot of unity in this community of Israel under Solomon. In chapter 5, Verse 4, Solomon is writing to his father's old friend, Haram. He needs cedar from Lebanon to help build God's temple. And he says this in verse 4, But now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side. Who wants rest and peace on every side? There is no more adversary nor misfortune or evil. Who wants no more adversary or misfortune, evil doing, as 
what it originally says. <clears throat> that word adversary there is actually, it says, there is, no, there is no more Satan. Satan, uh, Satan is not the devil's name, it's a title. Satan uh, actually just means the accuser. That's his title, he's accuser. Solomon says, the Lord my God has given me rest on every side. There is no more Satan in the midst of their community. Who'd like that for your church, your family, <clears throat> your community, your city? I always think that when they accomplish something in the Old Testament without Jesus, before they were born again, it's interesting. It's a challenge for us to look at, right? Challenge, it's a challenge for us. They accomplished this under the old covenant, under the law, this community where there was no adversary, no misfortune. And for us as believers, as spirit-filled people, after the cross, we have opportunity to step into that. We go to Colorado every year um, for a youth camp. We go way up in, onto this mountain, and it's high. It's like, you know, getting high to where you can't, you can't breathe very well anymore. You got to drink a lot of water or something bad will happen. I don't know. They say you'll get sick and pass out or something. I don't know. I always drink a lot of water because I don't want to find out. I always get excited when we go to Colorado, not because I'm a big fan of Colorado or because I like sleeping in a room with like 13 crazy teenagers anymore and showering in community showers and all that. It's just, yeah, that's great. I get excited when we call, go to Colorado because I don't do snakes. Anybody else in here not do snakes? Like, there's a snake in here, you're out. That's me. I don't do snakes. I don't do sharks, and I don't do storms. I don't like any of them. Uh, but for now, just no, no, no snakes. If you got a pet snake, I don't know. Those are not pets. Somebody, somebody at my church was saying they had a pet python or something. I was like, oh, Lord, the devil is a snake. <laughs> I don't do cats either, so I don't know. The devil must be a cat too. I don't know. <clears throat> anyway. I don't do snakes, but I get excited when we go to Colorado because in Colorado, in America, there's this thing called the snake line. If you get up to a high enough altitude, there are no more snakes. Did you know that? If you get up to a high enough altitude, snakes don't go up there. I just want to encourage you and suggest to you as a church, as a whole, remember, I'm talking as community. This has application for your own life. But as a community, as a church, there's a place in God that is above the snake line where they don't have access anymore. You get there, you get to that place through wisdom, through hearing God's voice, through the direction he gives. I challenge you, a lot of times we pray, God fix this situation, God fix this, God do this. Just try, um, instead of asking for God to affect the things that are external, ask him to affect you internally, to give you wisdom. You'll miss out on 50% of your answers to prayer because sometimes God wants to do something for you, but sometimes he wants to do something through you, right? And if you... Just uh, look at how your prayer life is. Many of us, myself included, it is focused on external things. God, I need this. God, I need you to fix this problem. I need you to do that. Instead of saying, God, look at me and change in me things that are not of you. So that when problems and circumstances come my way, they are, me, they are greeted by Jesus in me, right? Right? And when they come and they run into me, there's too much of me there. Get rid of that so that your sun shines through. Cool. 
Worship team can go ahead and come back up. <clears throat> I'm going to pray for you, but I want to just give you a little bit of homework before I do. The book of Proverbs, which I didn't get into, uh, I heard it said one time that it is the divine seminary or the divine Bible college. It is the book that is full of the wisdom of God. I believe it opens the heart of people to receive that wisdom that we talked about tonight. So I challenge you all, just read through the book of Proverbs. My, in Proverbs, I have so many highlighted things with question marks that I'm like, I don't get what this means. I don't understand what this is. But someday, <laughs> through wisdom, God will unlock this thing to me. Um, reading your Bible, uh, you don't read it to comprehend it. You don't read it to memorize it. Like I said, it's like food. You don't have to remember what you ate for breakfast today. It, st it still brought you nourishment, right? This brings nourishment to your soul. When you read it, your spirit is strengthened. Let's bow our heads and pray. God, I just bless everyone here. Lord, I ask that you give this place, this body, this community wisdom, Lord. That they would be a people whose heart hears you. That their heart is guided in sharing you to their community, Lord. Their heart is guided in every decision. It's guided in every relationship and every situation, God. I thank you. Your, your word says that before the foundation of the earth, the lamb was slain. What that says to me is before there was a problem, you already had a solution. And I thank you for every situation, God, before there was a problem, you already had the solution. Lord, so give us ears to hear what you're saying. Thank you that you let us co-labor with you, God, that you want to work and operate with and through your children, Father, to affect this world to affect Riverside. Holy Spirit, just come right now, Lord. As we sing to you, we invite your presence. We say we're here for you, God. We want to encamp. We want to put our, our tents down, Lord around your presence. So Holy Spirit, just come. Speak to every heart in this place, Lord. Speak the message you want. Speak to people. Let them know your thoughts about them, Lord Jesus, right now. Let's sing this song together. <clears throat>